We are in our second Sunday of Advent, and the second Sunday, right? First Sunday is, oh, first Sunday, sometimes they call it the hope, the candle of the hope, or for us is Old Testament, kind of looking at all the Old Testament things and seeing where is that leading or what were some of the things God had said in the Old Testament that leads to Christ, right? And last week we did the whole story of the seed. Uh, this week, uh, they usually call it the peace candle, and I know there's a whole thing on that, but it, for us, it's... We're going to be looking at John the Baptist, uh, the, the person that prepares the way. And I don't think I've ever, actually ever preached on this passage. I was looking at my sermon, my sermon catalog. <laughs> it's like, huh, I don't think I've ever preached on this one. So we're going to be looking at not so much John, because we usually start with John, and he's baptizing, and he's dressed in his camel, cam, his camel vest and eating, what was it? Was it cricket or loc- locust and honey, right? They think sometimes that locusts might be like chocolate. But anyway, that's that was one of my professors. Um, so that's what we normally start at, but we're going to start a little earlier than that. We're going to look at his, his birth announcement because it's I think there's some things in there that are yeah, similar but a little different than what we normally talk about for him. So yeah, let's jump in. If your Bibles can turn to Luke, Book of Luke. I was actually thinking about continuing the Book of Luke just as a thought into the new year, but... We'll see. Um, So here, let's begin the book of Luke here. Uh, Luke 1, 1, 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first, uh, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the, know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Okay, so this is how, the, this is how Luke, which he was a doctor, right? This is how he starts off his gospel. And the point of it, he's, he's really saying this. He said, I interviewed everybody. <laughs> I checked it out from A to B. I went and ca- cross-checked, and I confirmed everything. Because he's, he's not including himself as an eyewitness. But as a medical doctor, he's like, all right, let me go and check this out. Let me go and interview people. Let me investigate. And that's basically what he's saying here. And the, he's writing to Theophilus, which is, depending how you translate it, could be lover of God or God's friend. And it's his idea that he's writing to someone, uh, an individual who is a believer, right? And the reason he's writing it is that he's saying, I'm trying to give you certainty of the things you've heard, that you can, you can know that I interviewed these people and that, if there's a counter story, those people could have countered it already because it's all this. The book, figure of the book of Luke was written 60, I think it's 60, 70, somewhere around there. It's within a generation of the people that saw Jesus and saw the resurrection and all that. So it's with this idea that if there was something that was going to come up, all the opponents would have brought it up by now. And so he's writing to this God follower and saying, here, let me give you certainty. Let me help you. Let me make a report of all the eyewitnesses' accounts so that you can be certain of what you've heard. And then what he goes next is he goes into John, the, the, explaining who is John? How, how did John the Baptist come up? Because he's, he's linking Old Testament into the New. And so this is kind of an interesting linkage that we will be looking at today. So verse 5. In the time of Herod, uh, king of Judah, or Judea, there's a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah uh, with his wife Elizabeth, who was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. And so there, the words well along in years makes them sound like, at least different commentators put them, 50s or 60s, you know, probably beyond the, the point of having, having kids, uh, naturally. And one of the things that are, they're pointing out here is that um, Zachariah and Elizabeth serve God very faithfully. They're not sinless. I mean, they're not morally sinless, but they are, in terms of all the rules and commandments, they are upright. You know, it's like, uh, it's like Job. I mean, Job didn't know if his kids sinned or not, but he would go ahead and offer sacrifices um, Abraham and Sarah are kind of written in the same idea where they, they're doing their best to follow what God has said. doesn't mean they're sinless, but they are doing what God has asked. 
And in the midst of that, in that culture, in Jewish culture, it was if God blesses you, he gives you kids. If you're faithful, God blesses you. It, 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 faithfulness equals blessings, and blessings in that culture was having children. And so for them, it's hard for them to understand, or it would have been hard for them to understand, why are they childless? Because they were faithful people. And that was their cultural expectation. We're faithful people. Why isn't God blessing us? And so this is the, this is one of the challenges, I think, even for us in, in our day and age of, you know, me, I think of American Christianity at times, that we equate blessings to stuff or good life or whatever it is, which isn't, I'm not saying that God doesn't bless and God doesn't provide a lot, but I know sometimes we think if God doesn't give us exactly what we want, we say, well, God doesn't love me. And so this is just a, it's, you know, Scripture points out that faithfulness doesn't always equal you everything working out the way that we want. Uh, but God still blesses and God still loves. Um, and then God does something amazing for them. Okay. So when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of the burning incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And so let me give you a little picture. Finally found a good picture. Oh, wait, sorry. Let me explain the Zechariah's thing. So Zechariah, the priests back in the Old Testament were split into by David. They were split into 24 divisions. So each division got to serve in the temple once a week, twice a year. I don't know how you figured that out. Maybe they split the month and a half or something. Okay, so they, they were once a week, twice a year, um, as well as for major festivals. And then each priest or an individual priest could only serve, could burn the incense once in his entire life because it's just too many priests. They couldn't all rotate them through. And here's a picture of the inside. So Holy of Holies is where they would have the Ark of the Covenant, or that's where they should have been. I think they lost it at some point after. But that was where the, that's where the Holy is Holy. That, you're only supposed to go in there once a year. You're supposed to burn uh, the Day of Atonement, right? You go and get the blood. You pour it out before the Ark of the Covenant. That's where you could only go once a year. But before that, in the, they call it the Holy Place, which is between the veil and the front door. <laughs> People would go in there, and they would rearrange the bread, or they would light the candles, or they would burn the incense. Those are kind of the three duties that the priests had. And so the other two guys would do the bread and the lamp, and they would walk out. And then Zechariah would stay in there, and he would pour the, there's a certain oil or a certain mix of perfume they're supposed to get, and he's supposed to pour it over the coals. And so he would, he would be there, in, there by himself, and while he was there, he'd be praying for, you know, probably for the nation. Right? And so after, you know, so everyone else is waiting outside the, outside the, outside the temple. So that's kind of what's going on here. They're talking about in this process here. So they're all waiting outside for him because once he goes in and burns it, I think they're saying, most commentators said, said half an hour. That, that's the time frame it's supposed to take for him to clean the thing up, put new coals in, pour the oil, you know, pray. And so they're waiting for him for about half an hour. So once he comes out, then he would go and give like a benediction or a, like a blessing on the people. And so this is kind of the, it's like the high point of his life, if you will, as a priest. One time, once in a, once in a lifetime deal, and everybody, whomever is waiting for God, whoever is a pious believer, you know, they're there for this moment, and they're waiting for him to come out. And so while he's in there, as we keep reading this, an angel appears, right? Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear, which is the normal reaction to, for most people when you're expect, in, a norm, in a place that you should only be and you're lighting something and all of a sudden someone appears next to you. That's the uh, normal response, gripped with fear. That's what everybody else happens in the, in the New Testament when they see an angel. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. That's what God always says to us. Do not be afraid. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, don't go running out of here. Don't, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bury you a son, and you are to give him the name John. 
He'll be a delight, or he'll be a joy and delight to you, and many will re rejoice because of his birth. For he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll never, uh, he is to never take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Right? And so the, one of the questions that came was, what was he actually praying for? And again, we don't think that he was going to spend his, the highlight of his moment <laughs> praying for himself. I mean, maybe he did, but you assume that he's actually, if you read the rest of this context, he, he's actually praying for the nation and most likely that the Messiah would come for the nation. Because we'll see this in a second, in the next set of verses, why, you know, because the next set of verse talks about that his son's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. So you're, you're assuming here that God, God is saying, yes, I'm answering your prayer. The Messiah is coming. But the prayer that you've had for a long time is that you will have a son. And you'll name him John. John means God is gracious or that yeah, God is gracious or God has been gracious. Um, which is funny because that's interesting. My mom named me after John. My name is supposed to, in the way I spell it and all that. She wanted me to be John versus the other meaning I heard was like sifting sand. <laughs> but, uh, so so I, was, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Etymology of my name here. All right, he'll be, so he's given the name John. And this, this idea that God is selecting his name is, is pointing out that he's supposed to be God's man. Right? And he starts listing out, there's like six characteristics that John is supposed to be, or that John will be. Right? He'll be a joy and delight. Probably, well, well, you know, kids are a delight and joy to their parents. That's, we can't deny that. So he's a joy and delight to both Zechariah and Elizabeth, but also to, for many, right? They'll delight at his birth because it is meaning something is going to be start happening, right? That, that if you look at John's life and what he does, People would rejoice because they, they knew that John was directing them towards the Messiah. Okay, number two is that he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. Again, this is the idea that when God looks at somebody, that they give him favor, right? That not, not everybody's considered great, actually, in the Bible. <laughs> no matter, you know, if you look at the Old Testament, the kings, they'll, some are said they walked with God or walked like David or they didn't. And so this idea of being great in the sight of the Lord means that God is paying attention to them and he is giving them honor. Right? Um, verse uh, number three is that uh, he is never to drink wine or other fermented drink. Uh, if you go back and look, actually New Testament and Old Testament have it. It's that idea of a Nazarite vow. Right? Paul takes a Nazarite vow. to He's going to cut off his hair at some point right, in the book of Acts. And it's to show that for that period of time that you are dedicated to serving the Lord for a certain purpose. And so while we never are sure that John is like a lifelong Nazarite, but the way that it's explained or it's pointed out for him, it's, he's going to play some unique role for God. That he's saying, hey, this, I'm setting him apart. This is how I, you know that he's, he's my guy. He's going to act differently. And if you look into this ministry, coat, camel skin coat, out in the desert, so that's, you know, that's this unique role. And he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And that word birth means actually in the womb. As we, as we continue on the book of Luke later on, we'll see that when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth when he's born, or when he's still in the womb, right, baby jumps and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, but it sounds like John speaking through Elizabeth. And so this idea that John is a special guy, right? Let's keep going. Um, many of the people of Israel, he will many of the people of Israel, he will bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, uh, to make a, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay, the last two things that John is, he's going to bring many back to God. If you think of his ministry, you know, at the Jordan River, I think all the people, right, he, he was creating such a commotion, if you will, out there that all the people are going out there that the leaders were like, hey, there's some guy out there. He's baptizing people. He's telling them to repent. Who is this guy? 
And so they send the leaders out there and say, hey, are you the Messiah? Are you, who are you? Why are you doing this? But in the midst of that, the people who are hearing him, right, they're saying, hey, how do I live, how do I live a right life? How do I, how do I live, you know, there's soldiers asking him, what should I do? How do I, how do I follow God in the midst of military? And it's like, don't, don't take more than you need, right? Don't oppress people. That's, so that's his, that's what he was doing. That's kind of the, the second part of his calling, right? He is to turn the people back to their fathers. Um, so let me explain a little bit more of that second one. All right, he'll go before the Lord, okay? If you think back to the book of Malachi, remember some of the passages we read in Malachi a couple weeks back? This is all those passages, right? He'll go before the Lord, preparing, he's preparing the way before him, right? The, the preparers back in those days, the idea was if you had a king that wanted to go somewhere, he would, well, he would send a front team to get make sure everyone knew he was coming. But for some kings, they would actually make a road. They literally just plow the road in front of them to make it flat for them. And that's kind of this idea that, he's, that John is supposed to be the one preparing people for the, for the Lord. And in the spirit and power of Elijah, uh, Elijah, if you think of, remember Elijah? Elijah was the one that challenged all the, the prophets, the false prophets on Mount Carmel. And he was really calling people back, hey, there's God. You don't have to do, live that way. That's not the right way to follow God. And he's, this angel is putting all these, I don't want to say it's expectations, but he's saying this is how this person will be. These are the things he's going to do. He isn't, you know, John isn't even alive yet. I mean, he's, in the mind of God, he is, but he's not, he hasn't been conceived yet. And God is putting all these Hey, this is what, if you watch his life, this is what's going to happen. He's going to turn the hearts of the father back to their children. This is a really hard one to figure out how to understand. The best way, the, the best one that made the most sense to me was, they always talked about how Ab Jewish people would all talk about how Abraham and Isaac and all those guys were watching over the nation. And so this phrase means that Abraham, Isaac, all their forerunners, didn't agree with what the new generation was doing. And so it was John's job to get the new generation to believe the same way like the older generation. And then, then they would now have the father's hearts would turn back to them because they're actually following, the, they have the same faith as the fathers. So it's, it's almost like your parents say, hey, you finally agreed to what I thought you were going to do or thought you should do. Sort of like that. Probably not the exact same feeling, but that's the idea that the young, the children are now having the same faith as their fathers. Ultimately, it's to prepare people for the Lord. Because John wasn't calling them to, because his, his message, right? Repent for the kingdom. or Repent because someone's coming after me. <laughs> right? So he wasn't calling them to follow him. He was saying, hey, there's someone coming after me. Look out for that guy. Okay, now how do you think Zechariah or... Two different questions. How do you think Zechariah responded? We already know that because it's written. How would you have responded? You think about whatever age you are. How would you, how have you responded? You're, you're doing this duty in a sacred place, and somebody comes up and goes, poof. <laughs> I don't know, I'll probably run away or punch him. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, oh. And he tells you these things. You're going to have his kids. And this is what he's going to be doing. You know, even if someone told you right now, hey, because in the Old Testament, in, in Revelation, we talk about, we hear that there's going to be two witnesses that are going to prepare the world again for Jesus to come, right? They're the two witnesses during the tribulation time. What if you were told, yeah, one of your kids, they're going to be one of those witnesses. What? <laughs> you mean the end time's coming soon? Right? I don't know how he'd respond. This is how Zechariah responds. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, meaning that I, in that day and age, it was, I know God because I, I've seen God. I've, I've been given his honor. 
Um, and I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent and not be able to uh, speak until the day this happens because you do not believe my words, which have come true at their prop, uh, which will come true at their proper time. Okay, unlike Mary, who, who asked kind of the similar question, Mary's was more like, okay, I'm a young person, I'm not married, how's this going to work? For Zechariah, it seems that he actually doubts the message. He actually doubts that, the, that whatever God just said is going to come true. Which is, inter well, I'm going to throw him under the bus, but who is Zechariah again? He's not some normal guy on the, on the road. Right? He's a priest. He's a priest that knows enough about the Old Testament to be able to go into the temple and, and be the light, the, light the incense. If anybody, he should be somebody that what? That should know God. I right? could hear God's voice. Go, oh, okay, I, something miraculous is happening. But it seems that he doubted. Right? And as a result of that, Zechariah was given a sign because that's what he's asking for. How can I be sure of this? Give me a sign. And Gabriel says, I'll give you a sign. The sign is that you're not going to be able to talk <laughs> until John is born. Right? Because Zachariah almost missed it. Right? He, he, if, you, if you think about this, end of Malachi to when this happens, this event happens, 400 years. People were assuming that God would said, stop speaking. Right? They kept looking back and saying, oh, God spoke. God was really active back then. But now, now he doesn't speak so much. We, we don't know what he wants. And then God shows up. And he says, hey, I have something for you. I don't know how you feel about your life or where you are and all the things that are going on. But sometimes we get wrapped up in all the things. I don't want to say they're small but the busyness of our lives. And we, we focus on them, and we, we invade our thoughts, invade our time, and, and we don't always hear it when God says, hey, I have something for you. And we, we're kind of, sometimes we're like Zachariah, actually. God, can you, not so much, again, I hope we don't, I hope over the many years I've been here, <laughs> I hope we're not the, hey, I, dis, I don't, I doubt the message, as much as, let me challenge that. Let me question that. And I've got, I want to know, I think you're telling me this, but can you prove it just a little bit more? Like, give me a little more evidence or a little more confidence that this is you. I hope that's what your response will be, more than the, oh, I doubt it, or I didn't hear it. Um, because Zachary, I, I, mean, I really feel like Zachary could have missed it, the more I think about it. And even though he was, he would have, she should have been the one to know. He should have been the first to say yes. An angel appeared, and I need to believe this. So meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When this time of service was completed, he returned home. Uh, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor, taking away my disgrace among the people. Right? Zachariah didn't just run home. He actually completed his term of service, which says something, too, about Christian workers and about how we no matter what happens, God is still calling us to complete whatever course we have. Um, he didn't just run off, even though he, you know, minor, I don't say minor. It was, he had started having some physical limitations. But this is something for people who are called to ministry to recognize, yeah, God still calls us. We still need to complete whatever we're, we're called to do. Um, but more than that, for Elizabeth, again, the, without having a child, she was disgraced, right? Public disgrace. Um, but with a child now, it signals her blessing, her favor amongst you know, from God. So what do we, what can we take away? What do we, what can we take home with us? Um, 
you know, Christmas is our yearly reminder that we should be uh, prepared for the coming of the Lord. I mean, we really should be prepared all the time because <laughs> that, that's the whole, that's one of the beliefs, right, that Christ's return is imminent, that he could return any day. Um, and, but even in the midst of that, and we kind of say, okay, well, there should be some signs for that before that comes. So, you know, okay. There's still this aspect of when God speaks, are we ready for it? Are we hearing, you know, in a position, are our hearts in a position of hearing when God speaks? Because sometimes we, we assume that God doesn't speak as much anymore. Right? We assume that God maybe doesn't always try to tell us things, either through the word or through our prayers or through when we're play, having quiet times. Or sometimes maybe it's just a random odd thought that's different from our normal th train of thought in any situation. Are we prepared to go, oh, hey, that's a different way of thinking. I mean, I, I find myself doing that at times when I'm in the midst of something and as I'm thinking about whatever it might be and I think, oh, hey, that's an interesting thought. That's very different from my current thought process. I and mean, it's either God, it could be myself, not really, usually. It could be, or, you know, it could be Satan, trying to turn me off to the wrong path. But those thoughts are, you're supposed to say, hey, wait, what is God trying to say to me? We, we, we don't want to be, throw them on their bus again, we don't want to be Zachariah, who almost missed it. So are we attentive, you know, being attentive to that? Are we, are we remembering that Christ is coming? That our Lord is coming? Are we living our lives in light of that? And as we kind of think, you know, if, if we knew Christ was going to return in two weeks, I don't say a week, but a week seems short. Say we knew he was going to return in two weeks. Say somehow we had some revelation. Yeah, two weeks. What are some things that you would need to do? Right? What are some things that you need to complete? You feel like, I, I still need to complete this. I can't, I'm not ready yet, God. What do I need to complete? Um, is there some place you need to go? And not, I'm not talking about, oh, I need to go to get my steak from Ruth Chris or something. <laughs> But is there a mission, is, there, is God calling me to a mission, mission spot, a, a place where I'm supposed to go and, and be a witness there? You know? Because that's what it means to be living in light of the Lord's coming. It means recalibrating our priorities to say, what is God, you know, what is God calling me to do? Where is God calling me to go? Or what is God call, or who is God calling me to speak to? Are there someone I'm supposed to speak to about God? Right? It's, it's, we don't do these things because we're like, oh, I just want to go to visit Europe. <laughs> it's a, no, God has called me to do this. And that's the second thing. You know, are we helping others prepare for the coming of the Lord? And, and it's, and ultimately this is just saying, are we helping people recognize their need for God? And sometimes it's a long journey. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's hard to know, okay, how do I speak to them? How do I build a relationship with them? Um, but ultimately, the, the challenge is I'm trying to help them to see that they need a Savior. Or even if you don't get to that, maybe, it's like, maybe you need to teach them that they, they need a healer, that God heals both mentally and physically. He has that possibility. He has a possibility of making them whole again. You know, I, I saw after God because I, I had a sense of power or powerlessness. I needed God's power. Um, maybe it's to make them, you know, sanctify or make them holy. Maybe they recognize that their lives are in shambles and it's like, oh, there's all these things that, are, that I know are not right in my life. I guess that you need God's help to get you there. Or maybe it's, that we, they need to recognize God or Jesus as their king. I think for me that was the, one of the big things is, you know, we have to learn to stop trying to run our lives. Uh, we have to allow God to direct our lives. And it's hard. That's a hard, you know, how do I entrust my life to something I can't see? And that is a jump. But in the midst of that, as we give God certain parts of our lives, we start seeing, oh, 
yeah, he, it works. He, he does take care of me. His, his, the principles, when I follow them, they actually do make sense. It, life is actually better when I follow God. You know, for me, it was relationships. That was my biggest hindrance. In, not hindrance. It's, that was my biggest hole in college and into my young adult years. It was I'm trying to find this person to fill this hole in my life. And God said, no, that's not right. It took me a while to figure that out. It wasn't until I figured out, yes, that when I follow God, he'll take care of everything else. So, okay, all right, God, I'm, I'm, I keep trying to do it my way. It's not working. Let's do it your way. Let's see what happens. And as the more you do that, you figure out, oh, I don't have to. I'm not struggling for myself. You know, Rely on my own, own strength and my own self-discipline to, to run my life. It's God. I mean, direct me. Tell me where I need to go. It still takes discipline. It still takes, still takes strength. But it's not all on you. It's, it's God helping you. When you ask him for that help, he shows up. And that's kind of what we can get from this passage, right? Zachariah almost missed it. He, he, he should have been the person to know it and to hear it and to accept it, but he didn't. He almost missed it. He got it at the end. <laughs> and God's, remember that God's patient with us. That God has something for each one of us. God has things in store for each one of us. And sometimes it's a matter of us hearing it and waiting and God being patient with us so that we can accept it. Uh, let me give you one more passage and they can, just to send you off here. Um, it comes out of second, uh, for Second Corinthians five, and it's talking about um, this idea that God has given us a certain ministry in life. It says all this is from God, who reconciled him, reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and He has committed to us the the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. All right? Christmas, again, it's a time to celebrate Christ's coming. But for us who are believers, it should be reflection on our lives. Saying, okay, well, where am I with God? Am I following him? Am I, am I doing what he wants me to do? Am I, you know, are other things cluttering my life that I need to remove? And as I follow him, then I... Am I reaching out to others, helping them recognize who this God is? Let um, me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for being our God. Lord, may you help us to, to recognize when you're trying to do something in our lives. As much as we you know, <laughs> look down on Zechariah or we, we want to think that we're better than him, Lord. Um, in the midst of our lives, there are so many things that happen. There are so many things going on. Um, life gets busier and busier, it seems, at times. And in the midst of that, Lord, you try to speak. Lord, may you give us the ears to hear and hearts to accept the things that you say. Uh, may we catch it when you, when you speak, when you speak in that quiet voice, when you, when you give us that odd thought that seems different from everything else we're thinking. May we test those thoughts, Lord, but may we also recognize us, recognize that it's from you. And Lord, when you speak, Lord, may we follow you. And we thank you for being a patient God that, that waits for us and that you know, jumps through some hoops for us to help us know that it's you. And Lord, we thank you for being a loving God that wants the best for us. Lord, we thank you for this yearly reminder and preparing ourselves for you, Lord, of preparing our hearts and our minds for the coming of your Son. May you continue to work in our lives, Lord. Help us to see you. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name.